So this morning I thought I would continue from where I left off. And people think, oh no, another talk on parents. Because <laughs> I gave two talks on parents, didn't I? I gave one on uh, respecting our parents, having respect for our parents. And the second one was on repaying our parents. So this is a, something very topical, of course, in the, in the West, because uh, it's not a common thing we have uh, in the West. In fact, it's usually the opposite. We tend to blame our parents for uh, a lot in the West. And anyway, we talked about that. But today is the follow-up talk. <laughs> and it's got a number of uh, different dimensions to it. And of course, that is forgiveness. It's forgiveness, not only for, uh, for parents, forgiving our parents, but parents forgiving us, <laughs> the children. This is a two-way process. And I call this, I've subtitled this talk, Emptying the Rubbish Bin. Emptying the Rubbish Bin. Because this is what forgiveness is about, emptying these negative emotions that we get so caught up with. So it's important that we, and this is a very important subject, it's also a very hard subject to, to you know, an area uh, a hard, hard uh, practice, as it were, to let go. So as I said, our parents, you know, we, we have a lot, to, we could say, to forgive our parents for, but they have a lot to forgive us for as well, because we may not have measured up to what their expectations. Usually, isn't it, most parents want so much more for the children, many of the things that they couldn't achieve or wanted to achieve, and so they want that for the children. And so, of course, it's sometimes a very big disappointment that they don't follow in those, that direction. Sometimes they, go in, they have to go in their own direction. We all know that. And I think parents know that as their children grow up, they, they become their own persons and they go in their own directions. Having said that, I know a family of uh, um, Buddhists who live not far from here. The entire family, doctors, <laughs> and even one of the grandchildren, a doctor, so really you can see that, you know, that sort of conditioning, that sort of expectation is, and also that example. Because when I hear that, I think maybe the parents, the children were so impressed with the examples of their, their parents being, both of them being doctors, they wanted to be doctors. They thought it was very worthwhile. So this can be a part of it. Also, this year, you may remember, it seems long, like a long time ago, you might remember New Year's Eve. Do you remember New Year's Eve? Just vaguely. <laughs> so New Year's Eve, we had the theme for New Year's Eve was forgiveness. That's what I'm talking about today, actually, be forgiveness. And of course, at the end of a year, it's always good to take stock of the year and forgive those things that weren't good and then to, to allow uh, for, to forgive those things and then allow for healing and growth and starting the new year afresh. And that's how, ideally, we would start each year. And in traditional Buddhist countries, of course, in April is the new year in most Buddhist countries, in Sri Lanka, in Thailand, Burma as well, I think. And there, the idea is to ask forgiveness of one's elders. And these, in terms of Buddhism, are usually, first of all, in Thailand, they ask forgiveness of the Buddha. They have a nice ceremony where they wash the Buddha. <laughs> In Sri Lanka, we don't have that, actually. And then they are forgiveness of monks, teachers, elders in the village, parents, and so on, so to start the new year. But forgiveness is very... It's an easy word to say, isn't it? Easy word to say, but hard to do. And who is the hardest person to forgive? Anybody? Ourselves, usually. We can sort of make allowances for others, but not for ourselves, so... And oftentimes, too, you know, we, there are some things that we just say, you know, unforgivable. And, you know, uh, these are the things that we really hang on to. Um, you know, it's like physical abuse is, is a very strong one, uh, or sexual abuse. And we're seeing a lot of that in the Hash Me Too campaign that's still going on. And a lot of the, the news that we uh, read about in the newspapers or see on the television or on the internet. So that's a very biggie, a big one. And so now I think there is some sense of healing for some of the people involved in that. And so that is very good. Um, and then psychological abuse is another one. You know, sometimes people don't hit or physically abuse the other person, uh, or sexually abuse them, but psychologically they run them down and they belittle them and it causes a lot of 
you know, uh, difficult emotions for that person because they start to doubt themselves and it can leave emotional wounds that uh, are there for a long time. So forgiving that is very hard. As, and also emotional abuse, it's a similar, similar thing, psychological or emotional abuse is very similar. But forgiveness is actually in our best interest. We know that, but it's very hard for us to do. As I mentioned, it's like emptying our mental or emotional rubbish bin. I mean, if we, if we left our rubbish bins full of rubbish for days, weeks, years, months, you could say months next, years and so on, it would really stink, it would be really awful if we didn't you know, put the rubbish out every week, the wheelie bins and so on. We would really have a health problem at home. However, with our mental health, we don't think like that, do we? We don't think, oh, I've got to empty the rubbish bin. You know, there's all these negative emotions that are running around me. You know, the, the sense of uh, being hurt by people, the sense perhaps of wanting revenge, uh, wanting to get something back from them. Or, you know, the other side of it can be expecting an apology from the person from, for what they've done. That is a, that's a good option. That's a positive option, really, isn't it? But the first thing about uh, forgiveness is to, to realise, isn't it, for each and every one of us, myself included, that this is rubbish. <laughs> if we don't think it's rubbish, we hold on to it. We think it's worth holding on to it. You know, these hurts that people, things people have said to us, things people have done to us in the past. We remember them, we hold on to them, we think they're unforgivable. And so therefore we, we just keep them in this rubbish bin in the mind. And we're the ones that have to live with this, this hurt. If it were only, it's not only hurt, is it? It's anger too, because we're angry that that person did that to us. And as I say, we want revenge or an apology, something like that. It has to be something quite strong. So if we know, for instance, that it is rubbish, you know, we know there's negative emotions. Most people here will know it. Most people watching the uh, internet will know that because it feels so dreadful. <laughs> you feel really wrung out when you're angry and you, you're remembering what people have said and done and you just can't let go of it. So why can't we empty the rubbish bin? That's a question for each of us to ask. Why can't we empty the rubbish bin? Anybody got any ideas? Probably it's my idea anyway. But. Just the detachment. That's, very, that's exactly it. It's because it's our rubbish. <laughs> you know, it's my rubbish. We can't let go of it. We're attached to that hurt and that, uh, um, that negative feeling in the mind. It's become part of us, actually. And as I say, we want revenge or an apology. And, of course, that's coming from the sense of what they've done to me, you know, to myself, to, to this I. And uh, a very interesting test. If you hear about other people's rubbish, do you have the same response? If you hear about somebody that's been badly treated uh, by somebody else, you may have a feeling for them, yet yeah, that's not good, but you certainly won't take it on board as a, as, a, as a personal thing because that's their business. Even if it's terrible business, we can have some empathy for them, but we, it's not our rubbish. So that's the very important thing about, uh, about uh, the, uh, these negative states of mind, the rubbish, the mental rubbish that we can't forgive. It's because it's ours. And of course, it's, uh, this is not a just once a year process, like at New Year we have that, we had that theme, forgiveness, and that's good. Forgiveness is a really like emptying the rubbish here. Every, every week we empty the rubbish. You know, if someone remembers, <laughs> we take the wheelie bins out. We have to empty the rubbish, the emotional rubbish, regularly, just to see it for what it is, that it is rubbish, that it is smelly, it is something unpleasant. And, and the and bottom line I always, I always find for myself is, what am I getting out of this? You know, when I feel angry or upset, you know, what somebody's done or said, what am I getting out of this? And that's a good way to bring me back to that sense of... Uh, it is rubbish, it is rubbish. And of course, uh, the theme for New Year's, you might remember, was forgiveness. But of course, whose who's, uh, formula forgiveness were we using a lot? I was referring to a lot. I use it a lot myself. 
Do you remember? These tests, <laughs> it's too early. This way you say, it's too early. <laughs> Do you remember Ajahn Brahms? Ajahn Brahms, uh, very clever actually. Yeah. AFL, yes, because it's very topical, isn't it? Because we just had the grand final of the AFL um, at the end of September, 28th of September. And of course, that stands for Australian Football League for those watching overseas who are completely bewildered. What do they mean, AFL? They all seem to think it's very serious or they can understand it. And that's just, of course, um, for Ajahn Brahm, he, he actually does a, a few versions of it, but usually it's acknowledge, forgive, and let go. It can be acknowledge, forgive, and learn. That's hopefully what we do. And most, most of this is actually a process, really, because acknowledge, forgive, let go sort of flows quite naturally once we, we get into it. And Ayakema, Ayakema, she, uh, she was one of my teachers, famous Buddhist nun who passed away in 1997 now. It's amazing. It's uh, 20, 21 years, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Can't believe it. She had a very similar formula, which is very useful too for us, called acknowledge, no blame, and change. Acknowledge, no blame, and change. So it's very similar to Ajahn Brahm's acknowledge, forgive, let go. So it's good to, uh, to realise that uh, forgiveness is a feeling. It is a feeling. It's an emotion. It's letting go of the past hurts that we've accumulated and forgiving ourselves and others. And I always like, uh, you know, in terms of this, to, uh, to mention the Buddha, always bring in the Buddha's teachings, the simile of the saw. Uh, I, I read that out, um, I think, at New Year. And it's always good to keep in mind when we get upset with what people say particularly, um, because it's addressing what people say. The Buddha's talking to the monks about, you know, things that people uh, would say that could be very hurtful. And so it's very relevant for us as Buddhists. And it's also good for us to keep in mind, whenever people do or say anything, we can remember, or try to remember the Buddha's simile of the saw. It's one of those similes, like many of the ones that the Buddha gave, that's unforgettable. I mean, if you see in Asia, have you seen in Asia where they have these two-handle saws? It's really extraordinary. I saw it in Sri Lanka. They still have them. And they have these big saws, and they have a person at each end, and they've got the log there, and one person is at the top end, and the other person's at the bottom end. And they usually got on a platform, soaring away. It's very, it, you can see it. It's quite a striking image. So this is what the Buddha said. He said, monks, even if bandits were to sever you savagely, limb by limb, with a two-handled saw, person at each end, today may be chainsaw. Uh, <laughs> I think probably Ajahn Brahm has used chainsaw. It's pretty, it's creative. He said, with a two-handled saw, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would, be ca would not be carrying out my teaching. Herein, monks, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare. That's the people with the two-handle saw, well, or the chainsaw. With a mind of loving kindness, without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting from them. We should really, really be starting from ourselves and then them. We shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving-kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train monks. That's a tall order, isn't it? But then he continues, and this is where we apply, the, how we apply the simile of the saw. So having had that, that image of the saw, and these two men, or the person with a chainsaw, busily cutting off your limbs, which I think, try and forget that. <laughs> that image is pretty, pretty difficult, actually. And then, the, this is the whole point of it, actually, that people often forget. And then he says, monks, if you keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind, do you see any course of speech, trivial or gross, that you could not endure? No, venerable sir. Of course not, compared to having your limbs sawn off by somebody with a two-handled, uh, two people with two-handled saw or a chainsaw. 
Therefore, monks, you should keep this advice on the simile of the saw constantly in mind. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. So that, so if we keep that in mind, when we, you know, when we get upset, uh, when people say, it's usually people saying things to us. Last night I had a teens group, and we were doing the uh, precept on not lying, but we actually did uh, right speech, which is part of the Noble Eightfold Path, and such an important part. Because this is really welcome. You, you, you've arrived early, I think. <laughs> this is such an important part of our lives because what we say actually causes a lot of the problems and, and actually a lot of the misinterpretations too, isn't it? Often we find when we check up with people, they didn't mean that. You know, and I know this from emails and uh, text messages are particularly good at this. And this was before the days of emoticons in, in particular, where you can put those happy faces or whatever, and uh, so they get an emotional idea of where you're coming from. People can misread what you write in a big way. I've had it before, and I've just been amazed. I thought, how do they get that interpretation from this? Couldn't, couldn't believe it. But of course, you know, the interpretations, the stories we, we uh, create around what we hear, see, smell, taste and touch are our own. But I say, let's make positive stories, wholesome stories, that's okay. The negative ones, we can do without. So some of the strategies for letting go, one of the big ones, I think, is just examples of it. How people have been able to forgive, to let go of the rubbish, the mental rubbish. And if you get examples of people that are forgiven the unforgivable, it, it does encourage us in a big way to think, wow, they can forgive that. Maybe I can forgive what that person said to me last week, or the fact they didn't do this, or they did that. And I mentioned this, of course, at the uh, New Year's, and uh, I encourage people to, to look this up too. This is the story of Eva Kaur, and she was a Jewish woman who was in the concentration camps during the Second World War. She and her sister were identical twins, and when they were taken to the concentration camp, the reason they survived uh, was they were twins. They went to Auschwitz, and at Auschwitz there was a doctor, Dr. Joseph Mengele, and he was doing experiments, and he wanted twins to do this experiment because he was working on genetics. He wanted to breed the, the Aryan race, you know, this idea that Hitler had and so forth. So she, this Eva Kaur, and her sister Miriam were used for medical experiments. They had many injections of drugs and diseases to see the reactions. And they had the, the, the two of them, because when you have twins, you, well, one is like the, the experiment and the other one is the, uh, the, the base for comparing, comparing the changes. And so they had many um, unpleasant experiences from that including one experience which shows this woman's Eva cause. She's 10 years old, <laughs> 10 years old, amazing, this is happening. And uh, one time she was injected with a, a disease, she didn't know what it was, but she got a fever very quickly and Dr. Joseph Mengele said that she'd be dead within two weeks and she, she was really so close to death, but she realised, if I die, my sister will be killed because no longer twins, so what's the point? They would not keep her alive. So she really had this determination to stay alive and she did at 10 years old, amazing. But, so she went through that, which is pretty unforgivable. And then in 1945, the camp was, um, uh, what did they say? Liberated, that's the word they use, liberated. They, the Russians liberated it. And uh, she went, uh, I think her sister too, uh, went to live in America, and, and her sister eventually went to Israel after that. And in the um, 80s, she visited Auschwitz, must, which must have been a very uh, um, more emotional experience for her, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be for anybody? And uh, it was there that she started to, um, to develop this feeling that she would like to forgive them. The give, forgive the Nazis, forgive those that had tortured her, her sister, and killed her whole family as well. And she met a Dr. Hans Munk there. And in 1995, they had a 50th anniversary for the liberation of this Auschwitz. 
And she wrote this, uh, this uh, she called it Amnesty to All Nazis, like forgiveness to all Nazis, which is pretty, pretty amazing that she could write that. And uh, this Dr. Munch, who was a, he was a, a doctor in the Auschwitz, in the, um, he, he, he didn't take part in the medical experiments, but he used to write the certificates for every time they killed a whole gas chamber full of people, he'd write one death certificate for all the people, that sort of thing. And uh, she'd met him, and um, so she, she decided she would write a letter she, she was impressed with him, I think, and he came to this, uh, this 50th anniversary with her, and with a whole lot of people were there. And the main point of this amnesty was, first of all, to, to make it clear to the world that the Holocaust had happened. Because people were saying, no, it didn't happen, it was just an invention, you know, and so on. So that was a big part of it, and she wanted a Nazi who was there to confirm that. But... So she, one of her central philosophy is really wonderful. Some of these things, I'll just read a few of her comments. And I think when we hear this, we think, yeah, maybe I can forgive the things that are uh, difficult for me. Why survive at all if you want to be sad, angry and hurting, she said. That is so foreign to who I am. I don't understand why the world is so much more willing to accept lashing out in anger rather than embracing uh, friendship and humanity. After the 50th anniversary, she wanted to write, she wanted to uh, do something to thank the uh, doctor, this Dr. Munch, who had taken part in the 50th anniversary. And it took her a long time to work out an idea. She thought, oh, came to her after 10 months, she said, I'll write a letter of forgiveness. This is an excellent strategy for all of us, whether we send it or not, <laughs> is to write a letter of forgiveness. And uh, so that she took on that idea, and it took her four months to actually write the letter. She took four months to write it, but she said about that letter, but what I discovered from writing the letter for myself was life-changing. I discovered that I had the power to forgive. No one, could, uh, no one could give me that power and no one could take it away. I have the power to forgive. And it was all mine to use in any way I wished. And uh, she said that discovery, she had, she, that she had the power to forgive, changed her life. And, well, this is a nice one. She said, after 50 years of being, almost 50 years of being a victim, she'd suddenly realised that she had this tremendous power that nobody could take away from her. Amazing, isn't it? Turn that around. And, of course, this uh, action by herself was not, not uh, unanimous, unanimously supported by other Holocaust survivors. They thought of her as a betrayer, actually, really. But she said, it's an act, this uh, forgiveness was an act of self-healing, self-liberation, and self-empowerment. We cannot change what happened, but we can change how we relate to it. We cannot change what happened, but we can change how we relate to it. That's the essence of forgiveness, isn't it? Realizing it's happened. And then, but how we deal with that is up to us, whether we continue to hold it, the hurt or not. And then she said, these are... This is very uh, important, actually. Well, is, uh, she said, I forgave the Nazis not because they deserve it, but because I deserve it. And that's so sensible, isn't it? The day, and then she says, a very interesting flow on for her was, the day I forgave the Nazis privately, I forgave my parents. So this relates to the previous talk too. Whom I'd hated all my life for not having saved me from Auschwitz. I mean, how could they? But anyway, children expect their parents to protect them. Mine couldn't. And then I forgave myself for hating my parents. That's how we are. <laughs> We're very complex beings, human beings. If you want to see more of uh, Eva Kaur, there is quite a few videos on uh, YouTube. There's video, so many videos, everything. And there's one called I Survived the Holocaust, uh, Twins, Twin Experiments on YouTube. So the important thing... Uh, part of the important strategy for, um, as you can see, for, uh, for forgiveness, for her to be able to forgive, is to have that acceptance that this has happened, this acknowledgement that it's happened. 
and then using wisdom to let go of it. And also the feeling like, I don't want to continue with this rubbish. You know, in a sense, if we hold on to the hurts that we have uh, accumulated from what people have said and done, that person is still having power over our lives. That person is still hurting us. Of course they're not. They may have well forgotten it. You know, and of course this harkens back, doesn't it, to Ajahn Brahm's wonderful saying, don't let anyone control your happiness. But we do. We, we, can, we create a, a, a lot of our unhappiness. We're, we're actually having a big input into. But of course, the essence of wisdom, what's the essence of wisdom in Buddhism? I think most people know comes in three words. All right. Do you know the Pali words? These are the, these, this is the wisdom that lets us, makes, allows us to forgive and let go. Anicca, dukkha, anatta. Yeah, anatta, yes. Anicca is impermanence, that everything is moving transient. Uh, and... Uh, um, Nothing lasts. So this is very important insight that, yes, we were hurt, you know, but we were hurt one time. That person did and said this to her, in Eva's case, many times with the needles that she was injected with and so on, but it was that experience. But we repeat it over and over again. Ajahn Brahm's favorite, uh, famous example, somebody calls us an idiot, probably they call us much worse. <laughs> And then we think about it, we brew over it, we get angry, we dwell on it, and we, call, we say, he called me an idiot, he called me an idiot, she called me an idiot, and we repeat it again and again. That person only said it once, but we're repeating it many times. So the wisdom of a Nietzsche is that finished, however unpleasant it was, it's finished, it's gone. And uh, so this is part of that transience. We, we're, try, we're holding on to something that's happened in the past, and we are actually bringing it into the present moment again and again because we can't let go of it. And also the very important thing, this is actually connected with realizing, ha, huh, this hurt, this negative emotion is rubbish, is realizing this is dukkha, this is unhappiness, this is suffering. Because we, we, we don't realize that, if we really realize that, you know, we would put it down. It's like, you know, the, the famous example, you know, if you pick up something really hot, you'll just drop it. <laughs> Once we realize something is dukkha, and then we just drop it. We know, no, nope, I'm not getting, any, getting anything out of this. So uh, this is very important. And of course, because of anatta, because of anicca, you know, the sense of transient, there is no permanent happiness. We cannot find it. There's no permanent unhappiness, good news. But also... There's no permanent self. You know, the self that I was last week is not the same as the self this week or possibly next week. You know, it's an ongoing progress, a, a, work, a work in progress. That's what I usually say, work in progress, ongoing process. So just in that, in the same way, you know, the person that hurt us by what they said or did, they're not going to be the same person in the future. Uh, uh, later, and we aren't the same either. But we tend to have that idea of, of people, don't we? That they are always like that. We have a solid idea of their identity. But fortunately, that's not the case. You know, and a good, good example of this, of course, is Angulimala. Have you heard of Angulimala? He was a serial killer at the time of the Buddha, a murderer. And in our vocabulary, we'd say, he's a murderer, he's a serial, serial killer. And that's how we would think of him, like a permanent state. He'll always be a serial killer, he'll always be a murderer. He became an fully enlightened. How is that possible? Because this uh, anicca, this transience, this change, moving on, because he met the Buddha, uh, he was able to develop... But we have an idea, we freeze people, don't we, in our experience, in, whether it be at work, and at school, wherever it is, we freeze them and say, they're like that. And of course we're focusing on particular area that are like that, <laughs> but also they're changing as well. So we can, it's good to, to uh, remember that. So the first step, of course, uh, um, forgiving is to acknowledge what has happened and of course Eva Kaur was very clear about what had happened if you see the videos of her she's great, she has an immense sense of clarity and kindness and forgiveness 
but they're so much so sensible too. When you listen to it, you think, "Yep, yeah, that's really sensible." So to be clear about it. Uh, but the important thing about acknowledging some some of these things is to realize it doesn't mean that we have to condone it. It doesn't mean that we agree with it. And this is half the power of the Hash Me Too campaign is acknowledging it, you know, accepting that these things have happened, bringing it out into the light. Which will not only be for the benefit of those who suffered, but for uh, other people too, you know, as a sort of keep it in our, our consciousness so that they don't have to go that way, they don't experience those things. So the lived example is very important and uh, developing these qualities of the Brahma Viharas. One of the ways actually for us to let go of negative mind states is to develop positive ones and then there's not so much room for these negative ones. So if we develop loving kindness, if we develop compassion, loving kindness for ourselves and others, compassion for ourselves and others, it's hard, much harder to hold on to these negative emotions. We can still, but it will soften them uh, and, uh, and will allow us to let go of them much easier. And of course, you know, the other Brahma Viharas, these are the divine abidings, a particularly good one for us when we can't forgive is upeka, equanimity. Equanimity is realizing that we all have our own conditioning, all have particularly our karma, we say. Our, our negative and positive actions in the past give rise to negative and positive actions in the future. So if somebody has done something that's terrible to us, you know, said something terrible to us, as Buddhists we can, we realize they won't get away with it. They will have to experience it in some form or shape uh, in the future. Sometimes we have instant karma. <laughs> you say something rotten to somebody and they give it back to you. <laughs> they create bad karma too, actually. <laughs> and it goes on. So, you know, we can see that nobody is going to get away with anything. So in that sense, we can let go or forgive a lot more easily. Let go of anger, basically. Let go of anger. So this is... a. Uh, and another aspect of that is to, to realize that we're all conditioned. This is not karma. We're all conditioned. And that person, due to their conditioning, the way they think, um, their experiences in the past, what they said and did is very natural. How else could they have done it? You know, How else could they have spoken? And it's the same for us. We have that humility to realize that we are a product of our conditioning. Some of it good. Uh, very good if we are listening, you know, focusing on Dhamma, on, on wholesome things like Dhamma and Buddha's teaching. But there's also the negative as well. So we are conditioned, they are conditioned. And for me, that makes it much easier to, to forgive. And the other thing that is very helpful in terms of forgiveness, and it actually puts things into perspective, it's great. It's why the Buddha emphasized it so often. What do you think that is? It's one thing that puts every, everything into perspective. In terms of whether it's important or not. Yep, exactly. God did one. Yep, it is. Because death puts everything in perspective. I call it the time of life when we get real. <laughs> You, when you're dying, you, you can, keeping up appearances is the last thing on your mind. <laughs> you know, you're think, not thinking about what will they think of me. You're not at all. You know, and this is a time. It's a very rich time actually to share with people, because that is, as I say, a very real and intense uh, time, meaningful time for that person and for those around them. And it 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 makes one realise. You know, if we think, uh, if I thought I'm going to die tomorrow. Many of the hurts that I have, I think, oh, God, why bother? Why bother? Just drop them. And, of course, this is exactly, you know, the experience we have. Is the Buddha echoed that in some words, his famous words from the Dhammapada. There are those who do not realize that one day we, must, we all must die. But those who realize this settle their quarrels. So it's good to do this before you're on our deathbeds. <laughs> Because then the quality of our life is lifted, isn't it? It improves once we forgive. Once, once we've emptied the rubbish bin, our lives are much, much better and much 
uh, the uh, the smell is much better as well <laughs> for, for ourselves and everybody else. And it's good to keep that in mind, that life is a limited offer and uh, that conditions apply. So then, you know, we'll hold on to these hurts less and less. We realise, well, you know, I want my life to be a positive uh, experience. I want it to be a development of wholesome qualities, you know, maybe even becoming enlightened. So these things don't fit in with that. Can I let go of them? You know, thinking, well, keeping in mind that I won't live forever. And uh, I always like, um, you've probably heard of Suzuki Roshi, he had a very nice uh, take on death. And he, he used to use the simile of a boat. He said, our lives are like getting on a boat that we know is going to sink. <laughs> Sometimes the boat sinks just out off, uh, just a little short distance from the wharf, from the jetty. Sometimes it gets further out into the ocean. Sometimes a long way out into the ocean. But uh, actually, if you think, how would you think, you know, if you got on board the Titanic knowing it's going to sink? You wouldn't do it. <laughs> This is the Buddha's advice, actually, don't do it. <laughs> Stop getting born, because this is what will happen again and again. I update this simile, actually. It's much, much stronger for us now. It's like we get on an aeroplane knowing it's going to crash. No, would you do it? You know, it's just, no, no way. Even if it's either going to crash just after takeoff or a long way, you know, a short distance after it or a long way after it, it's going to crash. And again, you know, this makes us realise what's important when we do that. And this was um, echoed by one of my experiences of going on arms round down here in Carnegie. It's near, it's a shopping area near this Buddhist centre in Melbourne. And uh, it has this, it's, it's probably a common one actually, and probably not just that cafe. It has this saying on the tables, it says, life is short, eat dessert first. <laughs> <laughs> life is short, eat dessert <laughs> Shows you priorities. So the dessert is, is what's priority, you know, what's important for you. The rest, forget it. <laughs> so. And another, another very important way to support this wisdom of forgiveness is to actually ask ourselves, you know, each and every one of us, I, I can ask myself, am I perfect? That's a good one, you know, am I perfect? That's, that's great. And, you know, have I never made a mistake? <laughs> so this is, a, this is a, makes it easier for us to forgive people, actually, when we realise, yeah, I, this, I've made mistakes. And we, maybe we can forgive their mistake too. Sometimes we can't convince ourselves it was a mistake. They were doing it deliberately, <laughs> fully aware of what they were doing. But... Uh, Another aspect of that too is when people, and this is a good way of anger management, when people treat us badly or say things or do things uh, that are not, not good, then to think of them as temporarily ill or mad. You know, one of Ajahn Brahm's very skillful ways of dealing with this is to think that if a person, if you knew a person had terminal cancer and they just said something dreadful to you or did something dreadful, you, you might be able to, you know, forgive them or let go of it much easier. You think, oh, God, goodness, you know, they're sick. And they're going to die soon. And, of course, that we fail to realise we're going to die sometime soon. So we don't know when. So, and also very important for the forgiveness of uh, forgiveness is just realising how it feels. Really get in contact with, uh, firstly, with not forgiving the anger, the hurt, really see it for what it is. Because if we really see these emotions for what they are, we're less likely to think they're worth holding on to. We're more prepared to let go of it. We realise that it's actually hurting us. We realise that it's like picking up that very hot thing and then we drop it. So it's very important. And also, you know, when we don't forgive, uh, even if we're right, there's a famous saying from Ajahn Chah, that we can be right but we, it can be not good. So in other words, yes, they did treat us very badly. They did the wrong thing. They said the wrong thing to us. But what, what we have, our reaction to it is not good. The unwholesome state of mind, the anger, the revenge, how dare they do that to me, and all that is definitely not wholesome, not good. So it's to realise, and this is how we realise it's rubbish, getting, that, uh, getting to understand that. And I saw 
Um, and I'll finish off fairly soon, but I just I want to finish with a little guided meditation. There's a wonderful saying I saw on the internet. This was for the New Year one, which is great. It just puts it so so well. Holding a grudge doesn't make you strong. Holding a grudge doesn't make you strong. It makes you bitter. <laughs> yes, relate to that one. Forgiving doesn't make you weak. It sets you free. That's lovely, isn't it? That's very true, I think, those things. So now I'd just like to do a brief uh, forgiveness meditation because in the end, you know, as I say, the, the idea of forgiving is very simple. We can understand it. It makes sense. But how to do it? And, of course, it has to come from wisdom. But there's another way, another strategy, which I'm going to use now, and that is if somebody that we really respect forgives us, we may be able to forgive ourselves because that person's forgiven us and we may be able to forgive others. And of course the person I'm thinking of is the Buddha. The Buddha, because he could forgive uh, people and actually there's nothing for him to <laughs> no, nothing for him to forgive in a sense because he realised that all those people, whether it be Angulimala, Patachara, all the people that were difficult, uh, uh, he had difficult experiences with, they were coming from their conditioning. There was no other way they could be, even though it was unpleasant for the Buddha. Uh, he perhaps would not think there was anything to forgive, you know, from, their, uh, from his side. From his side, nothing to forgive. From their side, everything to forgive, <laughs> especially from a, uh, uh, from a Buddha. So if someone like the Buddha can forgive, or a spiritual teacher, um, you know, any spiritual teacher that one has a lot of respect, because most of these spiritual teachers, the Buddha included, particularly, is they embody kindness, metta, loving kindness, maitri, this forgiveness, compassion. The only reason for a Buddha to exist is compassion, isn't it? He's done the work. He's perfectly at ease and happy uh, with his life. And he could easily have lived it very contentedly, very happily, and passed into Parinibbana, finished with being reborn. And that would be it. But the only reason for him to exist, for an enlightened being, any enlightened being, is compassion. So they can be, one, be an example, and also perhaps teach if people are open to that teaching. So that's where the, uh, the Buddha, the Buddhas come from, not only our Buddha, but many Buddhas before. So if you'd like to just find a comfortable position, it's getting harder, this will only be about five minutes, so... <laughs> And then we can finish and have the, uh, any questions, if there are any questions. So we can close our eyes, get in contact with the body in the present moment and just make it as comfortable as possible for this meditation. And we can visualize uh, or bring to mind the Buddha. You can see the Buddha wherever you, um, a favorite place that you know that he lived in. Maybe it's the Jetavana in um, Savati or any of the places, the Bodhi tree in, in uh, Buddha Gaya or Bodh Gaya. Just see him sitting there and coming up and bowing and sitting in front of him. Sitting in meditation and experiencing the Buddha's metta, loving kindness, this incredible acceptance, an incredible sense of safety, of ease, just filling us with this warmth, like he did for Nalagiri, the mad elephant who was charging him one time. Just getting in contact with that energy of kindness from the Buddha. And we can, in our minds, we can think, please forgive me for anything I did or said or thought that was unwholesome or negative whether it was intentional or unintentional.
And then we can bring this beautiful sense of metta and forgiveness from the Buddha into ourselves and fill ourselves with this joy, this acceptance, this warmth, kindness. Filling ourselves from head to toe. And we can think, if the Buddha can forgive me unconditionally, I can forgive myself. Everything will be all right. And now we can bring to mind friends, family and friends, those we're close to. And as a group or individuals, we can fill them with this metta, this forgiveness and metta from the Buddha, filling them with this sense of acceptance just as they are, this kindness, warmth, non judgmentalness and we can say to them from our hearts I forgive you for anything you did or said or failed to do or say that hurt me or upset me whether you did did that intentionally or unintentionally, so I forgive. And we can ask for forgiveness as well, both sides of the coin. Please forgive me for anything I did or said or failed to do or say that hurt you or upset you, whether I did them intentionally or not. Filling them with this forgiveness this, the, the metta, the loving kindness of the Buddha. And then we can bring to mind all beings, just open it out to anyone, whether they be human beings, animals, insects, whatever, and give, fill them with a sense of metta and forgiveness. say to all those beings, I forgive you for anything you did or said or failed to do or say that hurt me or upset me, whether you did them intentionally or unintentionally. And also the other side, please forgive me for anything I did or said or failed to do or say that hurt you or upset you, whether I did them intentionally or not. And now we can just check up on how we feel now. Whatever we feel, if we feel more peaceful, more forgiving, more at ease with ourselves and others. And what caused these feelings to come up? And now we can return to the, the image of the Buddha we started with, maybe at a monastery, under a Bodhi tree, under the Bodhi tree, wherever. 
and anchor that in our hearts, that feeling of warmth, acceptance, just as we are, and forgiveness. And now we can slowly open our eyes and move our bodies to make ourselves more comfortable. So I'd like to end the talk there with just to encouraging yourself, your, everyone, myself included, to empty the rubbish bin <laughs> for our own happiness. You know, get the wheelie bin out onto the verge <laughs> as soon as possible so that all those years of accumulation can go and that we can be much lighter, much happier and, and in the process in, bring up a, a, a sense of peace and resolution in our lives. So I'd like to finish with that. And if there are any questions there, you're welcome to ask. All oh, right, there's a few. Right, uh, just to maybe, yeah, just. Forgiveness is a very, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big area actually. It's an important one. It's letting go, it's giving up attachment. Hello, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your talk. And I yeah. heard it as a very neat summary of the Buddhist idea of forgiveness. Ah, oh, thank you. As a, so I guess I was hearing a generic picture. Um, as, a, as a therapist of over 40 years, yeah. I, have to, I just feel like I have to speak out for my yeah. clients because yeah. I think that recognising rubbish is a very hard thing to do <laughs> because it? what we're calling rubbish here is deep pain and trauma yep. Yep. and we don't know what to do with it and we bury it and we hide mm. it and we mm. do all sorts of things to get away from it. Mm. And I think we need compassion with those people to actually walk with them with their pain, mm. unpacking it, trying to understand it. Mm. And I think it's only then that we're really able to recognise it as rubbish and let it go. Yeah. Thank I you. think it's important, yes, if you give it a social context, as we're having now with the hash me too, you know, in a big way. And then it's not only the individuals that are benefiting from that, but the whole society, actually. Because we're having a... Um, a, a quantum change in our awareness, actually, which is good, you know. It's something that can be very beneficial. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree with you, yeah. It's not an easy thing, because some of these things are unforgivable. Yeah, that story of Eva Core, I mean, God. <laughs> Took 50 years, <laughs> wow. did you say? 50 yeah, years? Yeah, exactly, yes. yeah. There was a lot of, yeah, you're, you're quite process. right. It was a long process. <laughs> it wasn't overnight. Thank not you. easy. Easy to say, not easy to do. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Very true. Hello, Liv. Thank you, Arjun. There's just so much to reflect on in that <laughs> talk. A lot, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, certainly when I'm putting up my rubbish bins on Thursday <laughs> night, <laughs> I think I'll do it on a weekly basis. <laughs> That's good. But I'd just like to very briefly share a story that I was very privileged to hear. Oh, good. I was working um, in a hospital. And it was quite late in the evening and this lady was talking about how she wanted to go to Sydney. And we said, well, you know, you'd be well enough to fly because she wasn't well. And she said, no, she wasn't good in confined spaces. And I knew she was Jewish. Um, anyway, she then recounted to me and her student that um, she'd been in a concentration camp and... Um, the Americans were coming, so they dug a pit and they buried them alive. And sadly, she um, became separated from her, her sister. Uh -huh. But somehow she miraculously survived. They think she, she found an air pocket or something, or the oh. air pocket found her. Anyway, to cut a long story short, she was then um, spent some time recuperating and she was in Vienna. Well, and she was... They said she had to leave, so she had the clothes she was in and these ridiculous pair of high heel shoes because there were none others left. So she was crossing a bridge. Now, she was very fortunate to have had a very good childhood full of love and music and laughter. So she said to me, she put one foot forward and she thought, I can go forward. I'm sorry, get a bit emotional, yeah, no, but no. Yeah. I can go forward with hate yeah. and that will destroy me. Yeah. Or I can go forward with with love. Yeah. And that's what she did. 
Isn't that wonderful? That's that's not easy to do, you know, especially coming from that and seeing her probably a sister and, and other family members and just died. She finally, uh, she made her way to Australia. She found a, um, she married mm. her husband who was from the same village, which was wonderful. And mm. apparently her home in Heidelberg was just a centre for everyone. All right. Isn't that lovely? That sort of sense of embracing. And full of love. Full of love, yeah. Because you could get very uh, insular, you could get very isolated and, and, and feel threatened by the world. Yeah, you know, so she was, to me nice. she was just a total inspiration. Isn't it? That's why I find Eva Kaur an inspiration because mm. I think what she forgave is much more than I could, anything that I had to deal with, you know. So, so there we are. And well, there any you. internet, I think some internet questions if there are. Forgiveness is, a, is, is quite a powerful thing. Oh, yes, yes. Within the simile of the saw, so yeah, there we are. Within the simile of the saw, yes. Yeah, within yeah. the simile of the saw, yeah. there was a line abiding or abide pervading mm -hmm. all. Yes. I didn't understand. Ah, was. all right. Because the, the idea of um, the, the, the practice of uh, metta is to, once we create it, uh, is to within ourselves, we have to have it within ourselves actually, first of all, and then to radiate it. And the Buddha classically radiates it to four directions, you know, so uh, four, four quarters he calls it, so that makes up experience of the whole, as it were, and then above and below. So the idea is that you have this quality of um, loving kindness, of friendliness in your heart, and then you start to radiate it. So what he's saying in that simile of the saw is, first of all, you radiate, you include this person who's just, uh, who's, who's sawing you up. <laughs> include them and then radiate it to the whole world. The experience of, of this, it creates a, a oneness of mind. So then the mind uh, can go into very, very deep meditation. We call them jhanas where the mind is very single-pointed, the mind's gone within itself, there is no contact with the outside world, and it's full of joy and happiness. Uh, that's you know an experience far, far different from any sight, smell, taste and touch, the happiness we can get from those. So that's what he's doing. He's putting it in a meditative context for, for the monks. Um, you know, it's, it's not meant... A lot of his similes, if you just take them at face value, the unforgettable ones, you might get the wrong message, I think. He's just making it stick in our minds. As I say, unforgettable. And there's so many unforgettable similes the Buddha may, uh, used. And the pur purpose of them is just to remind us. Yeah, yeah. If, they, if someone's sawing my limbs off with a chainsaw and I get angry about it, that I wouldn't be practicing what he taught. Now that's that's really difficult for us. That's a, that's a tall order, but we just keep it in mind, and it gives us a perspective that anything anybody says, and this is the context the Buddha is using in particular in this teaching, or does, is nothing compared to that. Just as I'm saying with Eva Kaur, you know, the things that we have to forget, by and large, most of them won't compare with what she went through as a ten-year-old <coughs> child. So that's the idea of this uh, spreading meta or uh, loving kindness, uh, radiating it, because you can, and it can become very, very powerful when it becomes. Uh, the Buddha called it the liberation of the mind through uh, loving kindness, liberation of the mind through friendliness, friendliness meta. So it's an incredibly powerful, powerful uh, quality you're developing. It's not. Not a soft and cuddly type of thing. It is. It includes that, but it's much, much more. <laughs> so thank you for that question. I hope that answered a bit. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, we have a question mm. from online. Yeah. Good. A person from the States. Good. So um, I can let go of anger towards those who have harmed me. Yeah, good. But I feel obligated not to forgive for the sake of others who have likewise been affected. Oh, all right. That's, yeah. a, that's good. I had never, hadn't really t uh, taken that into account. That one could, um, of course, the question one would have to ask is if you think that's going to benefit others, you know. Of course, you know, if, for instance, um, you know, with this Hash Me Too campaign, of course, that's very much people standing up and 
and uh, giving their experience for the not only for their own benefit, particularly for their benefit actually, but for the benefit of many others that have suffered the same abuse. But the thing is, if we can't, cannot let go of it, if we don't let go of it, we have to keep that hurt. We have to keep reviving that memory. Um, and if it's associated with any of the negative states of mind, then it's not worth keeping. But if this person, for instance, you know, one of, uh, you see it with Eva Kaur, for instance, her big, one of her big uh, things is to actually teach people, you know, about forgiveness. And she uses her experience in the concentration camp. She's not forgetting it. She's using it um, to teach people that how they can forgive, how they can live a more positive, happy life. You know, how they can get on with their lives, even when the unacceptable has happened. You know, and so for sure it's not necessary to necessarily forget this. You can use them for a vehicle for teaching as well. But to certainly if it's accompanied with any negative emotions, that's no good. Whether the, obviously this person mentions they haven't got any anger and so on, that's good. That's good. And as long as there's no other uh, uh, emotions attached with it. Because the other side of it, and I think you would probably see this, is sometimes there can be depression there can be the sadness um, and those sorts of qualities. Anger is one end, one part of the emotional spectrum, but the other end of the spectrum is depression and all this sadness that can really just overwhelm one. That's not useful either, actually. <laughs> Self-blame. Self that, that's actually that's a very big thing that uh, people who have been in these situations often have a lot. They think, well, it must be my fault that it happened, really. And that's just awful that they take it personally like that. So that's part of it. So I hope that answered it. If it's if it's not coming from any negative emotion, then it's good to you can use it. Like Eva Kaur is talking about her experience, she's not forgetting it, as a vehicle for people being able to forgive and live better lives. That's great. Very good. There we are. That's it. All right. So now we can finish off by paying respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha.